Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Sonoma Ready Animal Preparedness and Evacuations. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about the important topic of animal preparedness and evacuations. We just went through this with the uh, Wallbridge fire. We've done it uh, through the Kincaid fire and prior to that through the uh, Sonoma Complex fire of 17. We very much appreciate everyone uh, being here tonight with us. We have some uh, great uh, panelists that can provide some excellent information on what you should be doing to make sure that you're prepared for that inevitable day in the future, no matter when it is, that you will have to uh, perhaps evacuate your animals from your residence, from your uh, small ranchette, your farm, as the case may be, and make sure that they're safe and make sure that you're safe as well. And we just wanted to make sure um, we gave you the information here tonight. We have a multi-department effort. It includes animal services, the university cooperative extension, the Agricultural Commissioner, the Sheriff's Office, the Emergency Management Department, uh, and your Supervisor's Office. And I'm here tonight with my colleague, Supervisor Shirley Zay. I'm gonna turn it over to Shirley uh, to help kick it off as well. Supervisor Zay? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, thank you, David. I, I guess I should call you rabbit tonight since we're talking about animals. <laughs> <laughs> But we are talking about small animals to large animals. So whatever type of animal you have, in my case, I have a horse that lives in David's district in Petaluma, but then I have a, a cat and a dog here too. And we, we know we have to be prepared. I just wanna say, um, I'm really excited about this, this panel tonight, really an all-star cast here. And so be writing down your questions. They're gonna talk briefly and, and we're gonna introduce them in just a moment. But first of all, I did want to introduce our translator, who is Jordy. And wave your hand there, Jordy. Um, and so here's uh, how you sign on if you want to um, hear the Spanish translation. And I will say it in Spanish. Um, Para aquellos en la pública que prefieren escuchar a la traducción simultánea al español, por favor, selección a icono de interpretación en la parte inferior de la Pantea de Zoom. Y selección el canal español o Spanish. Y en diferentes uh, cosas, el, el, el botón es arriba y bajo. <laughs> okay, so um, tonight is all about having a plan for your animals, um, large and small. And some of us have already had to test our plan as recently as this August when the Wallbridge and Myers fires came to Sonoma County. Um, I had a chance to visit uh, more than once the animals at the fairgrounds evacuation site amidst the fires, including the most adorable litter of puppies I've ever seen um, that were also sheltering there safely. So we, we may be in the middle of fire season, but it's never too late to learn and to prepare for emergency. Everyone here tonight is a little different. And for me personally, when I think about evacuating my animals, I think about my horse, Lucy, because uh, she doesn't live with me. She's in Petaluma. Um, but I have made a plan with her stable to ensure that she will be safely evacuated. And uh, making plans is all about partnership. It's about neighbors helping neighbors. And the way we plan demonstrates all the best qualities of the Sonoma County residents especially our love for our animals. Uh, but we can't forget our smaller pets like cats and dogs. They need a plan too. Uh, they need go bags, just like humans. I have go bags packed for my dog, Millie, my Shetland sheepdog, and my uh, rescue kitty, Betty, with enough food and water and medications and any other thing uh, like toys and bones and stuff to get them through an evacuation. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Supervisor Rabbit to introduce our first panelist. And again, I want to thank all the panelists for taking the time out of their evening to join us. So with that, take it away. Thank you, Supervisor. I appreciate that very much. And, you know, we said we had these, uh, uh, what, three events in successive years, it seems like. But every event is different. Yeah. Uh, every event has different characteristics. Certainly we all remember in 17, we pretty much woke up to a path of destruction, wicked winds and fast moving fire. Um, this last event, the wall bridge seemed to be here for quite a while, moving at a different pace in a different direction. So every event is different. And it, um, I only mention that because uh, we still, you need to make sure that you have that plan in place. 
uh, and you need to make sure that you have, um, you know where you're going to go, you know what you're going to do, and you need to do it early enough to make sure that you can carry it out, not knowing uh, what's going to happen uh, once you've been given that word. And I can tell you, I don't think it's a coincidence that the areas are getting larger for the evacuations because we've all seen uh, the destruction that can occur in these fires and the amount of um, structure loss and, um, and, and still unfortunately uh, people uh, perishing in flames. Uh, we've been lucky here the last two years in Sonoma, uh, but we all know that that is a still a, a, a big reality out there. I do want to go to um, talk about how the Sheriff's Office uh, works within this because many times these areas are going to be on evacuation routes. They're already going to be um, closed off to the public coming in, uh, but we want to make sure that you understand uh, how this works within the system as we go forward. And I want to introduce James Noggle, the Sonoma County Assistant Sheriff, a lifelong Sonoma resident and uh, who grew up on a horse ranch, uh, married into dairy, so he certainly knows all about animals here in Sonoma County, and he knows our county inside and out. He's been front and center on really helping us. And I got to say, uh, Sheriff, thank you so much for uh, all the help uh, on all issues, not just through the uh, disasters, but through the COVID disaster as well and, and dealing with those issues. So, um, uh, uh, Sheriff, Assistant Sheriff Noggle, if you can uh, give us your, uh, give us some expertise there. All right, well, hey, thank you very much. And, and you know what, I, this definitely wasn't something we did alone and everything we've done has been in a, a group effort, especially when it comes to the, the ag stuff. It, it really has been, there was a whole group of us that have been working together on this for, for several weeks now and kind of got pushed a little bit faster than we had planned in August. But no, it's, it's really been a treat to work with the county on this. And I think we're really working to our, towards a great product. Um, and, you know, like Supervisor Rabbit said, you know, this is the, we've had three fires in four years. I don't know if we're ever going to officially get out of fire season anymore. Uh, for us, it seems like we're either planning for it or dealing with it. So you know, it, it's been just a, a crazy ride. And, and so one of the things we've really learned over those three fires is that moving lar large animals and really any animals in the middle of these fires is very difficult and very dangerous. Um, you know, it's, it's tough and dangerous for the animals, for the owners and for the haulers, you know. And so that's one of the reasons we're really pushing to encourage all of you to have a plan, you know, have a detailed plan and, and act quickly and, and as soon as possible. And like Supervisor Zane said, is even amongst the ag community, everybody has different resources and different things they bring to the table. So really work with your neighbors and get a, get a plan together, you know, because these things can happen very quickly. Um, and make sure those plans include, you know, a place to take them and a way to get there, you know. And, and obviously, if, if you don't have a way to get your animals out or don't have a place to take them, we'll have resources in place you're gonna hear from several speakers today that are involved in that part of it, you know, but really, you know, we wanna encourage you to, to use the county or use us as your plan B. You know, if something doesn't go right in the plan you have, then that's when we can step in and, and really help you out. Um, and so one thing I did wanna re revisit is, is everybody should know by now, but there are two types of evacuation notices that go out during these. Obviously the evacuation order which is a mandatory thing. It means you're in harm's way and you're legally required to leave quickly and calmly. Um, and then there's an evacuation warning, which is the optional part of it. And the reason I bring that up is the evacuation warning still means that you're very close to danger and you may have to leave if, if it gets elevated to a, an order. And where that's significant to, to the ag community is that that's when we're encouraging you to really put your plan in place, you know, because it's going to take longer. It's going to be more difficult to get the animals out. The more animals you have, the larger herds you have, obviously it's going to take more time. So what we're really going to start encouraging is, is at that warning level is to start implementing your plan and start moving your animals and start getting out of the way. That way, you know, it's just going to be a lot safer and, and cleaner for, for all of you involved. Um, again, you know, the sheriff's office, has always valued ag in this community and what it means. And it's just really been an honor to, to work with the county on this. And I really think we're making some great progress. And um, I think we have time for questions if there's any of me right now. Great, thank you very much, Assistant Sheriff. Appreciate that very much. I'll go back to uh, Supervisor Zane and perhaps we'll, we'll go through and then uh, make sure that we save enough time uh, for questions here at the end. And uh, I'll try to be looking for those as we go. 
And uh, I do have one question. So I'm choking on something for Sheriff Noggle. And thank you so much for what you've done. Um, everyone is so busy. What's, what's the one thing that people need to do to prepare to evacuate their animals? If you could give one thing. Yeah, so, and really the one thing is to have that plan, you know, and, and that plan needs, it's really specific for the type of place you have. You know, it can be something as simple as, hey, if I've got 500 acres, I know that if I've got cattle back in the, the back hundred, that's probably not the best place to get them out. So I need to move them up to the, to the front 20. You know, maybe, maybe the one thing I would say is kind of have a pre-set plan. Like, so in other words, where can you put your animals that will be the best place to get them out? Or, or w what resources do you have? Um, yeah, it's tough to pick one because it's such a unique thing. You know, you go from people like you that have one horse to people that have a 1,400 head dairy farm, you know. So I, I would say that pre-preparation that pre -preparation is probably the most important is have a plan to where even before or even in a warning, the first notice you see of either a fire or, or even during these PSPSs, you have a spot to put your animals that it's going to make it the easiest and the safest to get them out. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. We did have a question um, on the Zoom um, chat asking about what uh, are there resources available to help people develop that plan? What should be included in it? And we, we keep telling people to have a plan, but how do we help them make sure that they have a plan in place that works for them that, that can be carried out? Sure. And one of the real big resources for that is our ag crimes uh, people. Our ag crimes guys are more than happy to come out and help you with that. And also uh, the Sonoma County Farm Bureau has been really active in this whole process. And we've been working with them on getting ideas out. So yeah, if you reach out to either the, the Rural Crimes Task Force through us or the Farm Bureau, those would be really good places to, to start as far as that goes. That's great. Any other questions, um, David? I do not see any at the, at the present and I don't see any hands raised. So um, if you want to go on to our next panelist, well, I'm sure that more people will be chiming in as we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, so our next introduction is Andrew Smith and may maybe many of you have not yet meeting him. We are so thrilled to have him. He is our new Sonoma County Agricultural Commissioner. So with that, I will pass it over to Andrew. Thank you, Supervisor Zane. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. And thank you to the, uh, <clears throat> I'm honored to be here on this wonderful people to be to work, working on this effort. You know, we started this effort with the Sonoma Ready Livestock Evacuation Program um, a number of months ago in collaboration with Supervisorial District staff, uh, the Sheriff's Office, Office of Emergency Management, Animal Services, UC Cooperative Extension, and of course, our office, the Department of Agriculture Weights and Measures. We were really excited to develop a, a plan and, and put a, push out a survey for, for livestock evacuation and, and fire and emergency preparedness planning. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get that far before we were confronted with the uh, Wallbridge fire. Um, but I think we all did glorious work together um, in collaboration with the EOC and the Sheriff's Office staff and Office of Emergency Management um, through the EOC to uh, deploy what we call the Ag Access Verification Program. It's not a pass, it's not a permit. It's an Ag Access Verification of bona fide agricultural operators in the County of Sonoma that have uh, you know, demonstrated that they're, they're commercial ag operations and that they have uh, essential and critical functions uh, related to the survival of their business and their livelihood behind evacuation lines. And so because we have um, a, the unique opportunity to, to provide lists of, uh, for crop reporting purposes and for other uh, ag permitting purposes to be able to vet agricultural businesses and then provide them with the information they need through an ag access verification form, um, that's, that's embossed and, and secure from fraud and that we uh, provide a list to the Sheriff's Office through the Operations 2 uh, Chair at the EOC each day that we participated in this. And we were able to help over 375 people uh, at least gain the opportunity for access 
Of course, access is ultimately granted by the uh, law enforcement at those checkpoints and the, the really close communication that they have by radio with firefighting um, resources. Um, you know, I'll echo what, what uh, Assistant Sheriff Noggle said and that it's important to have a plan um, and it's important to be able to, to, to get out when you can. Uh, but, you know, with that said, when you can't get them out, well, then you need to get back in to, to see to them, to water livestock, to feed livestock. If you're a dairy, you know, you're milking twice a day. And what we wanted to do uh, in, in this effort and in efforts moving forward is to have a countywide collaborative approach that provides a program to help people that are livestock operators as well as other agricultural practitioners to be able to get in and get the work done that they need to do for the survival of their businesses and their livelihoods. And so we're working right now in collaboration, um, like I said, with multiple departments and supervisorial district staff uh, and the Board of Supervisors is to get on, to get a program together where we can pre-vet uh, folks that, that would need to gain access to properties during an evacuation or an emergency or disaster and, and put that program in place so that when, when these things strike, when, when disaster strikes, that we're already ready to react. You know, um, this is also a practice and continuous process improvement. And so from each fire and, and disaster episode, we've learned uh, from, our, from our mistakes, we've learned what worked well, and we've tried to build upon that. Of course, we'll continue to build into the future to create a program that's as robust as it needs to be to provide locations in the county where evacuated animals can be housed, and also to provide people with the reassurance that they need that they'll be able to access their, their commercial ag operations to get the work done. Because as we all know, agriculture does not stop for anything. And that includes disasters like fires, uh, floods, and any other thing that comes our way. And I think one thing we've learned is that Sonoma County is it's full of resiliency. And that um, our agricultural community uh, in particular is a very resilient one. And so we just want to do everything we can from the county level to help all of you ag practitioners out there with livestock and animals to be able to get the help you need to ensure that your and your, your family members are safe in these times. Um, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. Thank you, Andrew. There is one question here that I think that uh, you could help us get an answer on. And that's a question from someone who's asking, what's the time frame for getting an ag, ag access uh, permit or verification during the fire itself? Can you describe that process and, about, and how long that would take for someone who's trying to get back to the property? Well, I want to I want to be conservative, and I want to over I want to um, under promise and over deliver, and that's our goal in the ag department. And I would say that at least 24 hours notice is going to be safe. If we get your notification, what we'd have to do is process that notification and turn it into a form, and then uh, you'll be able to come and pick up that form. We get a wet signature, and then we apply uh, an anti fraud um, embossed to it so that it can't be copied. And then, um, then we'll, you'll be able to come pick it up and, and, and head out to the property. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to get access. But, you know, like I said, law enforcement and fire uh, services is going to be the one that is able to get access based on the level of safety in the area you're trying to get to. Uh, we look forward in the future to creating a pre-vetting program where uh, perhaps we can create a process by which to vet people either through a tax document or some other way to vet their commercial agricultural activity and create an ID badge program similar to uh, counties like Ventura um, so that perhaps you won't need to contact us in the future, but right now it's about a 24 hour turnaround, so. I had one other question too, um, uh, David, for Andrew, and that was um, if, if I have livestock that are still on the property in a mandatory evac zone, who should I call first? Should I call you? Should I call the sheriff? Should I call animal control? Who would I call first? You know that we're working on that right now. And, and I think we need to get all the departments that have uh, input in this process at the table. But of course, your first, your first bet is going to be to try and contact the EOC. 
whether it's two on one or whether it's trying to contact directly um, or trying to reach out to our department directly. Uh, ultimately, the sheriff's office would be the clearinghouse for anybody that needed to gain access. Uh, and we're, we're currently working on that right now. But uh, there's numerous resources available and uh, dispatches. Um, we're, we're, we're working on, on getting a, a single uh, line. And actually, you know, while I'm here today, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, agriculture and our ag department has been invited to have a seat at the EOC. So in the future, there may be numerous lines available for people to uh, get help, whether it's through the EOC or whether it's through one of our departments directly. So no wrong, no and, uh, wrong door, right? That's what you're saying, no wrong door in terms of getting help. That's right. We'll get you to the right place. Okay, great. Thank you. There's another question here, Andrew, that I think is uh, that you could answer for us. And is there a pre-incident <clears throat> process for applying mm -hmm. for an access verification document? Or is the process initiated only after an incident is a declared disaster? Uh, that's a very good question, Supervisor Rabbit. And, and I, I would just like to answer that with, you know, we're working on it. Um, we're working on a pre-verification program at the moment, but that requires us all to get to the table. Uh, those that have skin in the game with respect to the departments that control access. And uh, we would love to create a pre-vetting program and a pre-verification program. But, and, we've, and we've worked on that. I think this particular um, webinar is, is um, uh, proof of that effort. And it just so happens that the last three fire episodes that we've had have been a triage effort because they've hit us before we were prepared to initiate our program. And I think, you know, with, with the fire season becoming a reality statewide, that it's that much more uh, important for us to, to prepare a program ahead of time, so. I would say, to be honest, I think that from 2017 to where we are today, things are vastly improved. And thank, yeah. thanks to all of you uh, for working so diligently on this. There's always room for improvement to fine tune and lessons learned, and we'll continue to make sure that we do that. But uh, I think the process has gone very smoothly. Uh, has worked very well. So uh, again, thank you for your leadership there. Thank you to the Assistant Sheriff. I know he's been involved from uh, the very beginning, uh, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, Christopher Godley. Um, there's one here that maybe the Sheriff could help answer. This particular uh, person lives on a dead end street, has two donkeys. Uh, it could be that the only road in and out is that single, you know, way in the dead end street. Um, there's a possible second exit through a neighbor's vineyard, but so far they've not been granted permission. Um, so what, uh, she asked what agency could help her with this, an easement or something for emergencies, but could you talk about the reality of an emergency in a situation like that and um, how that could actually work in the field and practical purposes? Yeah, so I'm assuming she means like if, if her main ingress was blocked by fire, yeah. <laughs> you go to your secondary route, um, you know, and, and that's one of those things you, you got to get your animals out you got to get out and, and that's you know we'll deal with that at the back end i would make contact with whatever vineyard owner there is and just let them know hey this if i get trapped you know if it is is this very limited access okay uh, you know hopefully they would be reasonable and that's what we were talking about earlier is really working with your neighbors now and not when it is an emergency you know and and so i, I don't know who the proper person to go would be to to get an easement necessarily but um, but if it's in the if it's in the middle of this or, or if you get your evacuation warning that's even more important for you to start thinking you know what I probably need to leave sooner rather than later you know obviously anything can happen but if you have time go especially in those circumstances I will go real quickly uh, one of the things that we're working on on the pre the pre vetting process is uh, an email list of all the people you know, where they're at and, and, and their ranches and things. And what we're gonna try to do is, there'll be a Nixle group that will be built off of that, that list as an ag specific Nixle we can send out and, and almost like a pre-warning to the warning. So the idea is to get all as much information out as we can to the ag community so you guys can make those decisions um, sooner rather than later. And I would just add to that um, individual who <clears throat> posed that question, while it may be, there may be a reason that that particular property owner doesn't want to do a deed restricted easement. 
it doesn't mean that that easement won't be or, or that access won't be available for you when you need it. And I think that's where the sheriff was going. And you could certainly, no matter what uh, supervisorial district you're in, you could always call your county supervisor to kind of help you maneuver through that. It may just be uh, an informal uh, agreement between property owners. I think we have a lot of that in the county and it's worked well. Um, you know, there's, uh, but we'll continue down that path. So I do appreciate that. I do want to address one other question that was up there about our nonprofit partners who uh, aren't necessarily on the panel with us today. And I just want to say, you know, I can think off the top of my head as I sit here about five or six or seven uh, great nonprofit partners who do great work out there, uh, both before, during, and after disasters. Um, and uh, we thank them for that. We want them to participate. They're certainly more than welcome uh, to, and I hope that they're watching tonight. Uh, but this particular uh, panel is really from our series of Sonoma Ready, and it's, it, it's an ongoing series of live uh, broadcasts about different types of uh, issues, whether it's wildfire, earthquake, um, drought, <laughs> you name it. And uh, we want to make sure that we get the information out from the county's perspective. We always have nonprofit partners who are always uh, stepping up. We live in a great community where there's lots of people with great passion. So I just want to make mention of that uh, as we go forward. Speaking of great passion, I want to introduce Christopher Godley, our uh, Director of Emergencies uh, Management. Uh, he is paid to be paranoid, as he says, and uh, it's been, <laughs> apparently it's been paying off because I think we've had, what, three fires, two floods, a drought, a pandemic, throw in a couple of uh, dozen seemingly PSPS days or more, and a few heat waves in there as well, even heading into this weekend. And uh, he has done a great job and is known uh, throughout the state uh, for preparing um, counties like ours, our county, uh, for the next inevitable uh, time that we need those services. So, uh, Mr. Godley, please. Uh, thank you, Supervisor, and good evening, everyone. I work with uh, the Department of Emergency Management. Uh, I can only share from the animal perspective. Uh, my daughter's picking up pets like crazy, and my wife has had to evacuate both my daughter and our 75-pound dog twice now without me. That's the, that's the problem. Uh, yeah. When she married me, I, I, when there's a disaster event, I leave before she can get help. So um, we do a little bit of work on that here at the home, I can tell you. Um, at the Department of Emergency Management, basically our job after 2017 especially is to really lean in and identify what can go wrong in the county and prepare for that, whether it is flood, fire, uh, everything else in between. Our key features, probably the most visible aspect of our operations are both the alert and warning program where we manage the SoCo alert subscription service as well as the wireless emergency alerts. Uh, and the Emergency Operations Center, where we're really trying to develop an ability for the county stakeholders, community-based organizations, county departments, city, special districts, private industry, to all come together to coordinate a massive response. And we've seen that really take off here in the last several years, as evidenced by the Kincaid fire, where we had to evacuate 180,000 people, the power shutoffs that affected up to 250,000 people, and the Wallbridge fire experience this year, although smaller, was certainly challenging given how the fire progressed into different areas and how evacuation zones shifted as the fire uh, continued to threaten different parts of the community. And it is quite a machine. I mean, we've got about 250 agencies that we hope to integrate into a cohesive response. And key to this though, however, despite all our efforts, Government is not necessarily the answer here. It really does come down to the ability for individuals, their families, their neighborhoods to connect and help each other out. And that's what we're hoping here, especially with animals. There's gonna be folks that are gonna need some help and we're looking for not government services to come to the rescue. We're really looking for each other to lean in and help each other out. I would share though that we write some plans. We've got some great ideas. We've really learned from our past best practices, we're applying them now. But a plan is only that, it is only a plan and things can change. I will highlight the fact that while we might have a plan to go into an area or you might have someone coming to help you evacuate animals, that's making the assumption that the roads are gonna stay open. Now, you may get a pass and maybe able to get in and get your animals, but if that road is closed because of a hazard, like a down tree or a down power line, that pass isn't gonna do you any good. And so we're asking everyone, especially those that are responsible for others, whether it's people or animals, 
to really move ahead and lean in during a response to these events and go early. Back that trailer up, find that fuel, get your friends over here now, and just in case you need to evacuate, you're ready to go. Or if you've got significant challenges in evacuating yourself, your family, or those animals that you're caring for, leave early, get out early. I know it's gonna be a waste of time, energy, fuel, and it's stress on the animals, but I'm here to tell you, despite our best laid plans, that may not work out. And so we're asking everyone to be especially diligent and moving ahead very quickly. And then finally, um, I know that's another, if you would burden to lay on everybody, everyone on this meeting tonight or listening in later is really concerned already about their ability to take care of themselves and the animals that they're in care of. And it's important to note that the best way to deal with that anxiety, the anxiousness that you might feel given all that's going on in the world today is really get in there and get ready. Get that equipment, get those lists of supplies if you're gonna need a checklist, get that plan that the sheriff alluded to, put that in place and that will really help ease your mind. It'll put you in a place of power when these events unfold, not necessarily fearful or reacting to the bad news that you might hear all around you, but a place where you can get that information and make decisions and take action to save yourselves, your family and your animals. Um, Sonoma County is ready. Sonoma's strong, we've talked about it before, Strong now is being able to help each other during this event as well as make sure that we're ready as well. That's it. I have, um, thank you so much, Chris. I have a, a question from a listener. Um, they said they live in a rural area with spotty cell service. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have suggestions for multiple forms of communication in case I have trouble connecting with my evacuation buddy? Yeah, that is a real challenge for us. Uh, we are working with the wireless broadband providers to see if they can beef up these towers, get better coverage into the county. And we're also pushing really hard on them. And we had some success this year requiring that they don't just go offline when the power goes out. They have to be able to maintain their capabilities, keep those towers running for at least 72 hours so that if people, when the power goes out, still need to talk to each other, or if we need to send warnings in that area, we can do so. There are very few workarounds though. Without a landline uh, and without a cell phone, it is challenging to talk to each other. The only other option we've had is folks have been really starting to pick up on radio again. Whether it's family uh, radio systems, you can buy the larger systems that allow you to talk five, 10 miles away, or even ham radio is picking up again as people feel like they need something in their back pocket in case the cell phone towers do go down. So we can highly recommend that. And in terms of warnings, we're asking everyone out there to buy a NOAA weather radio. Basically, you plug it in, you tune it to the local antenna here on Mount Sonoma, and you let it sit. And at three o'clock in the morning, if something's going on, we'll activate that system. The radio will turn itself on and you'll get that message. Even if cell phone towers are out and you can't use your cell phone for that. Great. David, any other questions on your part? I don't see one. I, I think this one that's up there is really going to be uh, better addressed by our fairgrounds folks. So I think okay. uh, if not, we'll come back and make sure. Uh, okay. I don't see any other questions right now. Oh, wait. Okay. This one just in on the phone. Mm -hmm. How can neighborhood groups uh, get together organizing and support one another? That's a good question because it really does drive to my central point that you're all going to be able to depend on each other a lot more than you can govern. God bless public safety, but in these major events, we've seen these events move so fast and so big, it can be overwhelming. So being able to turn to your neighbors in an organized way is the way to go. And one of the models that we support here in Sonoma County is called the Communities Organizing to Prepare for Emergency, or COP, or COPE groups, if you would. These are very active, especially in the rural areas, where we know it's going to take a while to get other resources in. These COPE groups are just simply networks that are being established in the neighborhoods where people have taken on leadership roles, kind of identified who lives where, what kind of resources are available right there, and what kind of needs might pop up, who might need assistance or communicate. Uh, those groups, we all the time, we help organize. County especially, and now in West County, we're starting to see even a network of those networks. Um, we do have a dedicated community preparedness program with Dr. Nancy and we're happy to support that. And it's socoemergency.org is where you can start. Great, it's a lot of information. And 
specifically about uh, children, about seniors, about disabled, all kinds of great information there. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for being here. And thank you. Um, we know you have a home away from home now. It's called the Emergency Operations Center. <laughs> anyway, thank you for being paranoid on behalf of our citizens, I might say. Uh, our next um, panel. Supervisor Zane, could I have, there's one last question. Uh, someone yeah. put up and just wanted uh, Chris to repeat the type of radio that you had recommended. Huh. Just sure, it's the uh, NOAA, N-O-A-A, or National Weather Service radio. These run about 20, maybe 30 bucks if you buy them in the store online and um, pretty simple to use and there are instructions for that also at socoemergency.org. I, 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 have mine. I saw you were looking for yours, David. I have mine here in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'll grab it after we start with Brian so to show everybody. Um, our next panel um, presenter <laughs> is Brian Whipple. And Brian is the Sonoma County Director of Animal Services. Um, I might also add that uh, Brian came to us with a lot of experience working with animals and disasters. I believe you worked with Katrina, did you not, Brian? I did, and thank you, Supervisor Zane. <laughs> I, I was at Katrina. I, my first experience was actually with uh, Hurricane Floyd way back ah. in the day. Um, and coming from the East Coast, we dealt with everything, snowstorms and hurricanes all the way up through the entire eastern seaboard. So, uh, but fires were a different thing coming to California, yeah. without a doubt. And, well, you know, take it away. Tell us, I know you've got tons of experience now <laughs> here as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you know, since 2017, we've, we've really put in a lot of effort to, to build up and bolster our, our animal services response efforts completely. Um, you know, we've, we've really worked on our plans. We've worked with the community to, to understand where the needs are, where we need to be, how we can communicate with people beforehand and, and really, you know, work on that, that, that building your, 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 your package, your, your, you know, your go kit, having everything ready for your animal that you would have for yourself. Uh, you know, and as Chris Godley said, you know, government's not going to be there right away. And, and that's true for everybody in the animal piece of it, that takes a little bit more effort by an owner to be prepared. You know, a lot of folks, they have horses, they have other large animals that have never been in a horse trailer. And I would say practice doing that. Load your, your horses as frequently as you can, because when there's an event, it's gonna be really hard for the responders to, to help with that animal. And same with your dogs and cats, if they don't get crated often, practice that with them. Um, that's a great way to, to prepare them. Um, get your medications for your animals, just like you would, and have them in a, in a, in a go bag or in a, in a package with their vet records and, and rabies certificates and, and whatever else that, that you have on a regular basis with food, water, and, and leashes and collars. Um, I'll also say microchip your animals, especially you can do that with horses as well. And that's a big thing if, if a horse does get out and we need to return a horse to somebody, we find them a lot just randomly right now on any, any given day out in the middle of a, a street and we've got to find an owner for that horse. And if you can get a microchip, do it. Um, they are available here locally without a doubt. Uh, speak to your veterinarian to do that. Um, dogs and cats, best way to get them, get your pet back to you, especially during a, a disaster event. Uh, you know, I can't stress that enough on how many successes that, that we do, that we've had on, on reunification with microchips. Mm. Um, you know, and then in particular, the Wallbridge fire that we just went through, it, it was a little different for us because in animal services, because it was a little slower moving than the last two that we've, that we've really been through. And, mm. and that gave us a little bit of extra time to prepare on our end and have some of the, the sheltering side pre-established and, and ready to go. Uh, working with the group that we are in now and in, in working on the, the access verification. That's huge. Um, you know, we've learned so much since 2017 uh, till now that, you know, we're, we're, we're getting so much better at this. And, and, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect response or a good response, but we get better as we go because we know what we have to work on. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, again, you know, animal services is here. You know, we, we responded to over about 890 calls, I think it was, uh, during the Wallbridge fire. Um, at the height of the sheltering, it was over 1,400 animals, all small and large that were being sheltered. 
And that takes the community's help to do that. And there are ways to volunteer in the community to, to be a part of the, the response effort. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. If I, so if I'm packing my uh, to-go kit, for my small animal, not my horse, and you're absolutely right about the practice in the trailer. I have a rescue horse. She does not like the trailer. Um, but what am I going to put in that to-go kit for that dog or cat? What should I consider? Sure. You're going to want food bowls, you know, food and water bowls. You're going to want at least a little bit of food. I mean, that is perishable. So you're going to want to change your stash, your, 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 your supply out every so often. Leashes, medication, uh, harnesses, and, and make sure you have tags. If you have vet records, keep a folder in that bag that has all that information, uh, especially the microchip number. Um, contact information for people that are outside of the area that could help as well. Um, say we have to go to a home, which is a, another thing that we do, is, is in, in do food and water drops before if there's been an animal left behind that can shelter in place. We're going to be looking for a way to contact an owner. And if we can't, we, we will hopefully get that in another way because there's, a, say, a packet in the barn that might have some information in it mm -hmm. that, that we can contact somebody. Or it's in a, in a bag someplace that, that was ready to go for the pet. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, David, do you have any questions? I do have one, and, and this is the question I'm also going to uh, pose just so our uh, fair uh, folks know this, but talking about capacity. In this case, talking about capacity at shelters for the animals and pets. Um, Brian, what's the, what's the capacity at the Sonoma County Shelter? Someone's afraid if they show up, there's not going to be enough room. Um, and can you just talk about our experience in the last couple of disasters yeah. and uh, what we were able to do to accommodate folks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the biggest thing that we do in, in our operation is when the event, we start seeing the warnings and, and the event starting off, we're going to actually transfer every available animal that we can to other locations. And that could be to Marin, that could be to San Francisco. And they, they take those animals on, animals that have already gone through their mandated hold periods or they're up for adoption. That way we've now cleared out space for, for folks to be able to bring their animals directly to us or if we have to evacuate them in the field. Um, our capacity inside the shelter is about a, is 118 dog runs that can be halved off. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can double that for the dogs. And then mm -hmm. for cats, we can, we can house probably around 90 cats. And in cats, you can actually get creative and find all sorts of places to, to set up a, a cage for a cat. So we found some interesting places over the years. Uh, and then we do have uh, 15 spots for small, like say rabbits. Um, we do have space for small flocks of chickens or, and, and maybe a few goats and, and sheep, uh, but horses and cows, we just don't have the space for. I appreciate that. And I appreciate there's always, you always got to save space for rabbits. That's really important in my world. <laughs> I appreciate that very and much. I, I have one other little question, but I think it's important. I work a lot with seniors and uh, not all seniors have gotten crates yet for their um, smaller animals. And crates tend to be heavy, especially when you put an animal in it. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations about where people can get crates, uh, where seniors can get crates? Um, do we have any extra at the animal shelter? Um, what about recommendations there? Yeah, no, in, in, in the height of an event, if somebody does need us some supplies, we can definitely help out with that. Um, whether it's, you know, us driving one out and helping you even load that animal in the crate and getting it out to the vehicle to, to find safety. Um, but if even before that, you want to be prepared, all the local pet stores will have, have different styles of crates. The, the, the metal ones are heavier, but the plastic ones usually are a little bit lighter for the smaller animals. The dogs, again, you know, that's going to be difficult and it's going to be what fits in your vehicle. But assistance with evacuation for anyone, that, that is something that we'll provide without a doubt. Our officers are out there to be able to help and, and maintain the, the, the safety for the community. That's great. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Uh, We'll move on to our next panelist to keep ourselves flowing here and on time. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Stephanie Larson. Uh, uh, Dr. Larson is the County Director and Livestock Range Management Advisor for the uh, UCCE, the University of California Cooperative Extension. Uh, she is in charge of safeguarding Sonoma County agriculture. She does that wonderfully through her advisory capacity, her research, the programs that take place within her office, and certainly her advocacy. 
And uh, she did get her PhD from Oregon State, and that's why I'm wearing this tonight. For you. Oh, that's <laughs> mean. <laughs> so please uh, share with us uh, on this particular topic. Well, thank you, uh, Supervisor Rabbit, and thanks to all the panelists and all of you that are listening. And I'm excited that and glad that this is being recorded because I think we'll be able to um, put this out on the county website and really uh, inform a lot more livestock and um, pet owners and dairy producers and horse owners and poultry producers on, on efforts that the county's taking. Uh, as we're all aware that wildfire is a significant threat, it's, it's happened you know, in the last three years many times, and it can be incredibly stressful to livestock producers, uh, um, dairy producers, poultry, all those folks involved in agriculture. And so in the past disasters, uh, UCC provided a conduit between livestock producers and animal services and the animal, the agriculture commissioner's office. And we assisted with access issues for evacuation of um, access issues or of uh, the evacuation, vac evacuation of livestock so people could get in and get their animals out or the assistance if the animals were left, we'd work with uh, animal services to care for the animals left in the evacuation zone. And that was really important because it's extremely stressful times. But from these past three years of disastrous fires, uh, it's become apparent that preparation through planning will improve human safety and animal handling. And so as everyone has mentioned before me, uh, in an effort to coordinate safe and effective animal evacuation in the community emergency or disaster, um, UCCE, myself, along with our dairy advisor, Randy Black, is collaborating with all these great uh, people that are on this, this panel tonight. Um, and we're working to assist producers in developing their own evacuation plan that they could rapidly deploy. And what that is, is, is helping people to go through the plan, you know, step by step and outlining what your operation is, you know, what kind of pasture gra grazing situations that you have, what kind of holding facilities that you have. So you can really thoughtfully take the time to, to think about if a disaster happens, what am I gonna do? Where can I move my animals to? What pasture options do I have? If you're an organic dairy, do I have access to additional organic pastures that I can move my animals to if I need to leave? Uh, what other feed um, it, options are there? And so we're, we're hoping to achieve this and help people work through this, um, through this also through a uh, preparedness checklist. So this, this idea that maybe we all think about when we're getting ready, okay, what would I pack up? My important papers, my cat, my dog, um, you know, my husband, maybe, I don't know, you know? And so, but it's this whole idea is how much time are you given? And I think the, the alerts have, have gotten great and, and much more efficient, but it, say if you were only given, you know, 15 minutes, what would you do for your animals? What, what could you do? Um, would you, you know, could you feed them and make sure they had feed and water for 72 hours? What if you were given 30 minutes? What if you're given an hour? So it's helping people to go through that process in a timely manner so that they can, you know, be prepared uh, through this checklist. And then we're also looking at, okay, maybe I'm a dairy and I have to stay in place. I'm gonna shelter in place. What are the roles and responsibilities I have as that owner for my animals, for my workers? What do I need to do to make sure that every, everyone, every animal on that, on that property is, is um, protected and safe? And so by doing this, we're hoping that we can help you prepare your home ranch and maybe other managed properties. You might, just, you might not just have animals at your home ranch, you have them on other pastures, and those pastures are in the evacuation zone. How can you be prepared? How can you quickly haul those animals out? Do you have a place to, to move them to? So the survey is also going to help you to um, look at your whole entire ranch. So you're going to look at your home, you're going to look at your animals, your barns, if you have other crops or any other infrastructure, and how do you best protect them in a disaster. So what we're hoping then to create from this checklist, from the shelter in place roles and responsibility, and through the survey is we're gonna help you develop a map. And that map's gonna be a real visible map that you have, you can look at it and say, okay, I know where everything is. I'm gonna outline where I have uh, the water, where the power supplies are, where the, the animals are, where the feed is kept. So say if somebody needs to come back to your property and um, access it, they'll know where to find the feed to feed your, you know, your, your three sheep and your five goats. Or if you have a guard dog so that um, Brian's staff doesn't um, have to worry about a guard dog that's doing their job and protecting the livestock, but also but could be a, a problem for his workers. So it's really important 
that we you know have this this flow of information and that the thing that from the university standpoint since i work for the university of california is that we have the ability to provide that information um, and keep it in a confidential manner and so that that information is going to stay um, within the university within the county and it won't be um, able to be accessed so if you're concerned about people having information about your you know your private this is going to be your information whether you want to share it with us or you want to keep it inside but it's this idea that we are prepared and that we have the ability to access your ranch if need be so it's really important to think about you know how much time am i going to need to evacuate if i'm given three days or or 30 minutes so we just want you to be prepared so that the evacuation is done safely and effectively and our goal here is to keep people and their animals safe avoid the loss of life and serious injury for both the people our pets and our livestock and we hope that this effort will help protect our community and our county's agriculture because it's really important and it's this opportunity is um is great for sonoma county that we can assist you and all animal um, owners to be better prepared in the next disaster i had one question for you um, dr larson and uh thank you for being here tonight um uh, somebody says that i can assist another rancher by housing livestock who do i contact this is great. This is absolutely what we're looking for is that information. I will tell you in the 2017 fire, um, you know, it caught us so off guard is that we put quickly put out the information through our office and asking if anybody could take animals. And the response was amazing. People um, just offered up their, their, um, their, their, if it was four acres or it was 400 acres. And so we were able to, you know, kind of match up those opportunities and we'll, we will continue to build that database. So part of this survey will be to reaching out to landowners that might not have livestock now that might be willing to house livestock or they have livestock and they could add additional livestock in case of an emergency. So that is also in the survey that we're creating is that ability to take additional animals on. And the thing is, is that, and I, I it was said earlier, is that we want it, this to be that people are prepared so that they're just not relying on, oh, I'm gonna go to the fairgrounds. We need you to rely on yourself, your neighbors, build this neighborhood community so that you know your neighbors, you can call your neighbors and that you have the ability to move your livestock as, as the further the least amount of distance as possible because that's very stressful when you have to move animals in a quick time fashion mm -hmm. right. can i just follow up on that do you think that there'll be a clearinghouse at all for someone to kind of uh, connect in maybe their neighbors aren't necessarily uh, in the same boat uh, don't have the same kind of animals but they're curious to kind of make those connections will there be a, a place for that to occur that is what our hopes is in the survey. I'm, I'm, I'm offering up our office to do that. Um, we work with a lot of different livestock, dairies, um, poultry, horse owners. Um, we can work with our nonprofits as, with that as well. But I think it's really key part of this survey is to look at you know, your whole community. So your neighbors, um, fellow uh, producers that you can connect with. Um, we're also looking at expanding grazing opportunities through a new program called Match.Graze. So that will be another opportunity to folks to find additional grazing lands that maybe didn't exist before. So whether it's in a disaster or it's um, an ongoing uh, process. So we're hoping that more grazing opportunities reduces fire fuels so that fires won't be quite the disaster that they've been in the past. There is a question in chat and I'll ask you, uh, Dr. Larson, since you are a doctor, can a chicken be microchipped? <laughs> I'm familiar with the thermometer in the turkeys, but I don't think it's the same thing. If you really want to microchip your chicken, I'm sure you can do it. There There's a go. lot of chickens that are very beloved pets, like Senator McGuire has a bunch of beloved chickens. So I just think that's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> but, I, but I take it what's true there is that that's not a common practice. So one wouldn't necessarily be looking for a microchip in a chicken. I can't say that one would, but maybe Brian has a uh, reader for chickens. I'm not sure. <laughs> Brian, have you ever had a read a chicken? Haven't to this point, but we might have to start. That's for sure. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate that. That was asked. Uh, and I, in all seriousness, we just want to make sure that we can address that as well. That's great. Uh, 
So I would just put out that um, um, the survey will be coming and we're excited to um, launch it. And this is kind of the beginning of this discussion with the survey and the preparedness checklist. And so I just encourage everyone to be watching for that survey and the, and the county to release that. And someone also asked in the, uh, in the question um, piece about, so interested in a plan, that uh, preparedness checklist could help them start to form a plan. And I, and I will um, mention a few other resources at the end uh, from some of, uh, some of our nonprofit partners, but that type of uh, information would be that kind of that first step to start a, having a plan in place for one's animals, correct? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's something that's fairly common in some of the Midwest areas where they have frequent um, disasters. And so it's, we've taken a lot of that information. We've um, looked at some of the other local nonprofits, what they have on their websites, which has been great information in trying to build something that we can make it so it's not too onerous for somebody to fill out, um, have a plan that really fits their needs, but it will be um, effective when they have to implement it. And one last question before we move on is just someone wanted to know, who is that, who is that survey going to? How are we getting that survey out? How far and wide will it be? Well, we're going to go through all of our um, livestock and dairy producers list, all our, our key partners that have members, membership, all our um, nonprofits that are working in the area of disaster preparedness and trying to get it out to everyone that, um, that we know that has animals, that people have been affected in the past um, with evacuation, and it'll be um, quite um, It'll be, it'll get a wide range of, um, of folks out there. Great, wonderful. Andrew, and you have something to add? I'm sorry. Sarah. I just wanted to say that we would be happy to, um, and we've already talked about this with, with doc, Dr. Larson, is to uh, circulate it to our confidential list of livestock operators that prepare uh, uh, crop report surveys for the crop report so that we can help them uh, with their evacuation needs if necessary. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Back to you, and, Supervisor Zane. Thank you, um, Supervisor Rabbit. By the way, here's what the radio looks like. I was able to find my the NOAA radio. It looks kind of old fashioned, you can carry it, but it works like Friday. Um, and Match.Grays, Dr. Larson, is Match.Grays live if I go to it? It's launching, it? it's launching the 1st of October. Okay, I'm excited. Yes. Match.Grays, yeah, that's great. Um, so speaking of um, housing animals, um, the next introduction is to a, a woman that has literally um, helped house thousands of animals since um, going back to the Tubbs fire. And um, all different types of animals, lots and lots of horses. Um, she came to us from Southern California after working for 22 years at Del Mar uh, racetrack. So she definitely knows horses. Um, but she is uh, one of the most capable people that I've ever met. And she's also here with, um, she's the CEO of the uh, Sonoma County Fairgrounds, Becky Bartling. And she's also here with Heather Bork, who is the Sonoma County Fairgrounds Exhibits Manager. So welcome Heather and, and welcome Becky. And I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Becky. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, just to add to that, I, I probably, I used to be able to say that I was the only fair manager that had, had been through five different fire evacuations. Well, now it's seven, and unfortunately, there are quite a few other fair managers that are, that are going through the same thing. And as we all know, this is the new normal, and, and it's uh, continuing to go on. Mm. The most important thing, and we've talked about that a lot tonight, is that you need to be prepared. And we have found um, that the more prepared you are, the faster our evacuation process can go. We have on our website uh, documents that you can download that gives us the information when you come into the fairgrounds that we'll utilize uh, on the, on the uh, stall that, that your animal may be in, uh, contact information and that kind of thing. And it's never too early to download that information and be prepared because again, as we know, this is the new normal and we're still in fire season and we're in the beginning of fire season and, and certainly this can happen. So um, preparedness is the most important thing that we can really talk about today. <clears throat> the other part that has brought up today is also have, a, have the buddy system, so to speak. Have somewhere you can take your animals 
that are not the fairgrounds if, if you need to do that. We are an emergency evacuation center. We are, are opened up when the county activates us. Um, we, uh, prior to some of these fires, we get calls prior to this county activating us and uh, we will do whatever we can to help anybody who needs to bring their animals to the fairgrounds. But a plan to have uh, set for you after the fires, after the evacuations are over, if you've had damage in your property is, is real key. The fair, fairgrounds will certainly be there to help you in that emergency evacuation. And that is part of our mandate as a, as a fairgrounds. We're not just corn dogs and Ferris wheels and that kind of thing. You know, one of, one of fairgrounds big uh, opportunities to assist the community is through these types of evacuations. But it is an emergency and you should have a plan to take your animals in the event that you've lost property, you've lost uh, fencing, you've lost that kind of thing long term. But again, uh, prepar preparation is the key. And we hope that we don't have any more of these, these fires, but unfortunately, uh, it, may be, it may be, you know, something that we see in the future again. Another part of what happens at the fairgrounds, and I, I need to give a big shout out to uh, CART, uh, Community Animal Rescue Team, which is activated by, by Brian with uh, Animal Services, is they provide a very key function to the fairgrounds here. And we appreciate that as far as uh, being there and mucking stalls and checking people in and, and making sure that our animals are taken care of. So um, I wanna thank that, thank, send a thank, out to, thank you out to them and also to Amber Bowen. Um, and a great team and great, and great support. Another thing that's important in these large animal evacuations is we don't take small cat, uh, animals. We don't pick cats and dogs. <clears throat> so Brian is, the, Brian is the key on that with animal services because we're, we're a large animal evacuation, although we'll take, you know, pot belly pigs and we do have housing for chickens. Not sure if they're chipped or not, but we do house chickens. Um, but pets, small pets, are uh, need to go to animal, animal the uh, uh, to Brian and animal services. Heather, and I'd like to turn it over to Heather if she's got some other items that she'd like to uh, mention. Great. Sure. Thanks, Becky. I think the the one thing I'm very appreciative that multiple of our panelists have been talking about being prepared, and really too, what we're talking about is owner responsibility. So being sure you have a plan, but then also if you do bring those animals to the fairgrounds, you're still responsible for them while they're at the fairgrounds. So making sure you're coming in, you're feeding at a reasonable time in the morning, you're feeding and watering at a reasonable time in the evening, but it is extremely important that you maintain that responsibility. Uh, and then as Becky mentioned too, we are in an emergency setting, but then having that plan for afterwards as well. Um, the paperwork is up on our website. Our website does get updated if we are activated. And it's also been mentioned, but every event is different. And so being just because it was one way last time, um, things may change depending on what the emergency situation is. And so that's just a caveat to that to remember to check out the Sonoma County emergency page as well. That's got great information on it. Um, and so just so that we can all stay informed as residents of Sonoma County as well. And Heather, I'd just like to also um, reiterate the importance of leaving when you have an evacuation order. Um, my first evacuation was in 2003 in San Diego. And at that point we had almost 1800 horses, but people waited too long and we had a lot of animals that came in injured and, and it is heartbreaking. Um, the 2007 fires, we had a few injured. Uh, 2019 we didn't. And this, this fire, we actually saw some animals that were injured as well. So please don't wait. Don't, don't try to sit, you know, sit it out. If, if there's an evacuation order or you're in a, in a zone that has an evacuation warning, it's key to try to get out when you can because it is absolutely heart heartbreaking to see those injured animals coming into the fairgrounds. That's a great reminder of folks uh, getting out there early and taking care of that. I I'm sure that as the um, you know smoke and 
flames are approaching that the animals themselves are going to be sensing that it might be a little more difficult to round them up, um, corral them, get them safely uh, to where they need to go. To that question, uh, and Diana had asked this, and I, I want to make sure that I ask our friends at the, um, at the fairgrounds, and maybe this even goes to uh, Mr. Godley. Uh, one of the questions is, if you do leave early, which is a great thing, with animals on evacuation warning order, will the fairgrounds be open? And will they be able to accept animals on a warning order? Or at what point in the process will the fairgrounds be open to accept animals? I think that's a great question. If we want people to leave early, we've got to make sure that we can accommodate them. And, and I know that these things are fast moving, especially at the beginning. Uh, anything that you can give us on, on how we make sure that we can have those places available for folks when they need them? Well, from my experience, um, we get the calls early from people wanting to evacuate. And uh, in the last couple of fires, I've made calls to the EOC say, asking if we should open up, um, which they're always very supportive of that and saying yes to that. So, you know, as the county, I know that everybody is most concerned about the well-being of people and the well-being of animals. So I have to say that I would never say no to folks wanting to bring their animals in, even if, even if you haven't called me yet. I, I appreciate that. Mr. Godley, that's, or, or, how does that work within the process that we have in the EOC today? So right now, we stand up pretty quick when a fire breaks, especially. We've seen probably weather coming. We're kind of leaning into it like we are for this weekend. So it's not a big delay. Once fire departments, fire chiefs get with the sheriff, especially for unincorporated areas, and they determine that we're going to have to evacuate, whether it's just a warning or an actual order. In either case, we're gonna be looking to resource the community at that point, both in terms of opening shelters for people who may be needing this place to go, as well as animals. It's gonna go pretty fast, uh, but if you beat us to the punch, if you smell smoke and you just drive down the hill to the fairgrounds, uh, we might not be ready for you at that moment, but we'll get there pretty fast. Um, we're hoping to get there within that first six to eight hours, to be honest, stand up the entire machine, um, but it's a challenge because these fires like today, we, we had one just here north of Santa Rosa, half an acre, no big deal, bang, 12 acres within 30 minutes. That takes a lot for us to gear up for and, and mobilize the machine. People are starting to talk about evacuations already. It would have taken us a few hours to get a hold of Becky, find staff. And by the way, we're pretty, Becky's running a pretty lean machine down there right now at the fairgrounds um, and make sure that we can open safely for the animals. And that's really important and not just throw, you know, everybody willy nilly into some acreage. It's gotta be done well so that we can make sure that people and the animals are safe. So to be clear though, for those that are asking the question that if you're in a warning area, not a mandatory evacuation area, you could evacuate your animals. Yep. We, we would like you to leave. We will get place for your animals. We'll give you food. Whatever we can do to get you out of there, we will do it. Great. And if, if, if I could add something to that, in the evacuation, uh, the most important thing is to get, you know, an animal in the stall, uh, get some water to the animal. Sometimes we don't, you know, we don't have feed till the next morning. Typically, all, all these evacuations, for some reason, all happened at two o'clock in the morning, but um, that's the most important thing, is getting the animals safely into a stall. So we do that, we can actually do that very quickly with not a lot of staff and um, we have help that comes in from our, our minimal staff and we do have other support. So the most important thing to us is get the animal in the stall, get them calmed down, get folks calmed down uh, because they're obviously you know, very concerned. And one thing I didn't mention is there are a lot of people that have multiple horses. You know, they might have four or five horses with a two horse trailer. So part of the preparation is if you have to evacuate and you have friends that have trailers, make sure you have connections with those because that is a, a big assistance to make sure you get your animals out. And I wanted to add, thank you, Becky, also that we all stand up a hall too, where we take, if you get evacuated and you have your dog or your cat with you, um, you can sleep right there um, next to your animals as long as they're in a, in a crate. And there'll be uh, lots of assistance for you and, and the animal. But um, with COVID, it's changed. <laughs> it has changed. Everything's changed. 
And so it's really important now more than ever to have plans of where you could go. A, a friend, um, a neighbor, a um, yeah, somebody who lives maybe a little bit out of town, you know, just to have those plans because we're not able to take as many people now in our evacuation shelters because of COVID. So again, the, the catch word of, of this night is prepare. And if I can, just to jump on that, the best way to really address evacuating animals is not necessarily to take them all to the fairgrounds. It's really identifying and potentially partnering, if you would, with somebody on the other side of the county, where if you're in trouble, you go there and vice versa. That way you're really not dependent on government services. You won't end up in a congested, congested space like the fairgrounds. It'll really help us quite a bit by relieving pressure on the system. And ultimately, it's probably going to be better for your animals to be in that environment rather than a big space like the fairgrounds. So we certainly recommend, you know, you've got a friend, somebody you don't hate that much, and they've got property, and they can probably put up with you for a few days and vice versa. That's really the way to go. Yeah, and, and I have, I wanted to note, too, that I know in the Santa Cruz fire in particular, uh, a lot of the hotels and motels were taking animals just for that very reason. And I know, Chris, we've talked in the past about the number of um, humans when we do these evacuations that go to shelters. And, and typically, I, I think the rule of thumb was kind of maybe 10%. And I know that 10% was gonna look a little daunting when we had the massive evacuations for the Kincaid fire. It turned out to be much, much less. But I, I don't know if there's a, um, any kind of data that uh, corresponds to animals. Uh, it must be tough to compile, but I don't know if more animals end up at um, the fairgrounds type shelters or with their friends, but I agree with you. Uh, just like when humans, it's better to find family and friends to stay with uh, the same is true for your animals, uh, if you can make that connection prior to the event. Well, I'll share with you generally, there are more dogs and cats in the Bay Area than there are children. So we'll put that in perspective. Okay, then for large animals, especially out in the unincorporated areas, there are way more animals out there than there are people. And, and Becky, if you want to jump in, she saw quite a crowd during Walbridge right there at the fairgrounds. Yeah. Uh, yes, I might did. have the numbers, yeah. Lots of animals, lots of animals uh, during Kincaid. And in fact, we uh, got to a point one night that we were full and we couldn't take any more animals on. Animals went to Sonoma Horse Park. Some animals went all the way down to Alameda. And, uh, you know, so you, we can fill up, which is, you know, to your point, point uh, Chris, it's very important to have a secondary location that you could take your animals to. I want to introduce uh, Allison um, from the uh, uh, Sonoma Marin Fairgrounds down here in Petaluma as well. During the Walbridge fire, I was lucky enough to go over and uh, see the animals that were being uh, cared for at, at our fairgrounds here in Petaluma. And, and by the way, we are very lucky to have not uh, one, but two or three uh, with Cloverdale Fairgrounds in this county. And I always want to remind people, I don't need, I know I, this crowd knows this well, and hopefully those with animals know this well, but fairgrounds are just an integral, important piece of infrastructure for counties for not only the day-to-day -day operations, the annual fair, which is a great tradition, but for instances like this. And uh, certainly our fairgrounds at Sonoma County has seen CAL FIRE's Incident Command Center camp, uh, which is a small little city coming in. Um, and not to, if we didn't have that space, we would be, quite frankly, hurting. So I, uh, and the same thing is said here in Petaluma. Uh, it is a treasure um, to have the fairgrounds here in Petaluma. And we have the CEO of the Petaluma Fairgrounds, the uh, Sonoma Marine Fairgrounds, Allison Keeney. I always want to put an R in your name, Allison. And um, I want to give you an opportunity. I think the day I was there, there must have been close to 700 animals. Now, a lot of them were birds. And one of the first questions I want to ask you, and maybe Heather can also chime in, is biosecurity, especially for birds. Uh, I know that there's been different things going on out there. Um, is it, um, someone's asking about the Newcastle issue. So maybe you could just throw that in as you, um, as you talk about the services that you provide uh, and talk about biosecurity. And I, I know I saw, uh, and I was, um, um, I think I was deloused before I could go see the animals, uh, right. but you're doing a, gr a great job in that regard. 
Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, we are the Southern County option. So if your evacuation plan uh, to the Sonoma County Fair gets uh, waylaid in some way, we are another option or perhaps your own sheltering option is somebody who lives in Petaluma or nearby. We're, a, we're another place that you can go. Uh, right. The day you were there, we had uh, tons of birds. In fact, you know, as everyone has said, every event is different. We never imagined that of the hundreds of animals, we would have two thirds of them be, be chickens and waterfowl. It was amazing. Um, and so, yes, every species brings with it a biosecurity challenge. Uh, those species need to be kept away from each other and those species from different locations, different homes, different coops, different farms all need to be kept separate from one another. And sometimes too, they need to be treated when they arrive. So to answer the question about virulent Newcastle, uh, ironically, after all the fairs have been canceled this year, the state veterinarian reached out to all of us. I think it was sometime in April and said, congratulations, virulent Newcastle is no longer a problem. So unfortunately that didn't do us much good, but every species has disease challenges and those are things that we have to be ready to deal with when we're bringing in animals into a congregate shelter, if you will, for livestock. And I know that you, you mentioned even the day I was there that rabbits were having, um, there was something with uh, going on with the rabbits in the county. And um, so I know that you were aware of that. And I, I also got to say that, and I'm sure this is true at the Sonoma County Fairgrounds, that um, daily vet visits um, for animals, take, uh, making sure that they're looking out for the uh, care of the animals, which is uh, quite frankly, probably more than the animals get uh, the normal course of the year. So uh, very appreciative for the care that the animals get when they're uh, in, in, within your facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're very, very fortunate to have great relationships with our local veterinarians, as I know Sonoma County is as well. So the animals do get looked after, cared for at least once a day while they're on our property. So I want to be clear with folks, because someone did post a question up there about what should they bring in um, with their animal, um, whether it's their individual feed, and is that something that could be accommodated, especially as the numbers grow? Uh, I'm just curious if if we are encouraging that or are we discouraging that? That's a great question. A lot of times the animals will arrive with feed and as you mentioned before, you know, th there's often a delay before that animal can get fed and watered as soon as they're, they're brought in. But once the veterinarian looks at them, it's, it's our practice to go ahead and treat them under veterinarian care and feed them the veterinarian approved diet while they're on our property. And that's for the just for the extra health and well-being of those animals. Um, but, but we're happy to take in um, whatever they come with. We're grateful for that too. Appreciate that. And can you talk in general, because uh, I know that the, the two facilities that we have in the county are different. For instance, you, uh, for horses, you don't have stalls or high stalls that horses uh, would rather have, uh, but uh, there, there are some available at the, at the fairgrounds uh, because of the racing and whatnot. Uh, just talk about the limitations and how that gets sorted and how that information gets out. It's important for people to know, if, based on the species, where they should bring that particular animal. Exactly. And, you know, Sonoma County Fair has their website. We have a Facebook page uh, that's just for animal evacuation. And one of your preparedness plans for those listening tonight would be to go to that page and uh, write down the email address go ahead and like that page because when we're activated, somebody is always monitoring that Facebook page. So through the messaging on that page, we can answer questions. We can let you know about availability. We can uh, let you know about capacity or we can make a local recommendation. So, you know, as Becky mentioned last year in Kincaid, uh, same thing for us, we would get calls uh, and that, you know, they come at the front office as well. We've always got somebody in our main office that can get information to livestock, but uh, we cannot take horses over 14 hands high. We hope that that will change in the coming year, but, but right now that's just not possible for us. But we can take just about everything else and we've got a lot of flexibility. But we may be referring somebody up to Santa Rosa. We may be referring horses to Alameda like we did last year. Um, and we try to keep our finger on the pulse of all the other fairgrounds around us so we know that we can refer somebody 
somewhere for just about anything that they need. And I assume that's the same with you, Becky, and you, Brian, in terms of coordinating where the animals are best uh, cared for and who has capacity for which type of species and where they can be better served. Yes, and, and it's interesting um, because during the Kincaid fire, we did re uh, refer animals down to Alameda. However, during this fire, Alameda is actually an evacuation center and a fire camp themselves. So um, it can be challenging, but you know, we, we've, we, sit, we sit around and talk about alternative plans. What if we actually ran out of space and we still needed to evacuate horses? Mm -hmm. There's always the Chris Beck Arena and you know, yeah. you let them all, let them out. The Speedway, we can always stick them in the Speedway if we had to. Right. Yeah. There's always a way. By the way, uh, Supervisor Rabbit, 14 hands is a pony. So you, you guys basically yeah. ponies, right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. And donkeys, right. And donkeys. So small. Yeah. The ponies and donkeys, good place. Yeah. Um, I, I, so a lot of people have asked, um, well, what if I get separated from my animals um, and they've been removed from the evacuation zone? How do, I, how do I locate them or claim them? What kind of documentation do I need to present at the fairgrounds? Well, when the haulers bring in the animals, at least to us, and I'll let Becky can answer this for, for them, uh, we've got the haul, the hauler will put, fill out the form when they arrive. So we know what the address was, where the animal was brought in from. They'll give us whatever information they can. And then nine times out of 10, the owner is contacting us and then we'll match the owner with the animal and then they can come on down and finish finish filling out their, their paperwork. Someone asked on the uh, in the questions about what if they can't evacuate the animals themselves? What information should they send with the person who can evacuate them uh, when they arrive at the fairgrounds? What do you need to know about who's being dropped off, ideally? Ideally, we'd need the, the veterinary records if they have them, but most importantly, uh, the contact information of the owner and then alternative contact information. Mm -hmm. um, what we really, really found this event is uh, we had some folks and I just want to I just want to say this, and this is on behalf of the team that you can meet by going to our Facebook page. Their profiles are all there. This is the most. Oh, should, you, should you just name the uh, Facebook the title of the Facebook page? Oh, else. certainly. It's Sonoma Marin Fairgrounds Livestock Evacuation Center. Great. The mouthful, but that's what it is. I didn't mean. Um, that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, but, but we know that the animals are stressed. We know it's a difficult time for them, but we know it's a difficult time for the owners as well. And so the staff and the volunteers are here to make it as easy as possible. We've noticed uh, this time, for some reason, a lot of things happen personally to owners and there was a lot of stress among them trying to figure out how do I get my animals home? We had some repopulation challenges. Um, we had some people concerned about finances, and we just want folks to know that your animals are here. There is no charge. We will help you with your repopulation efforts. If there is some other way that we need to work with, uh, with Brian or any of the county teams, you know, we're all connected to each other, and we'll find a way to make the situation work for you. So please don't worry. But if something happens to you, we need a way to get a hold of somebody else as well. So that emergency contact information on behalf of your animal is really important. So something like that um, would be great to be kept in a, a sealed watertight um, plastic bag. Yeah, Ziploc so bag would be great. Take it with you and, uh, and have it there uh, and to follow your animal around and wherever they may be. I think that sounds, sounds like a plan. Um, Supervisor Zane, do you have anything? Yeah, the dog starts barking. Speaking of animals. Speaking of animals. No, she's got a little bark collar on her, too. Um, uh, yeah, just, you know, I, I just really want to thank the panel. You guys have just been fabulous. There, there's a lot of thought and a lot of care that goes into evacuating our animals. And we know that for you, you know, and for us, our animals are part of our family. And so it's really important that we prepare for them um, and and we want to really thank you as, as public servants and all that you guys do to take care of them and knowing that they are members of our family. So um, thank you. And uh, we are going to go out and do the best we can to prepare. Yeah, no, I'd echo that. There's one question here. I just want to make sure that we answer this for this uh, uh, okay. attendee. It says, to Mr. Godley's point, are the resources to try to, we're, uh, 
are there resources to try to make these connections? And I think it had to do with connecting with your neighbor, connecting with those. And I will point back to Dr. Larson, the survey will help uh, yes. get some of that information out and including what our Ag Commissioner Andrew Smith will include with his uh, questionnaire for the uh, crop report. And that's gonna be a building uh, database that we'll have going forward. So it may not be complete as we speak today, but it'll be building, it'll be building, and we can make sure that we continue going forward. Andrew? I, I just wanted to say, you know, these events are very uh, trying on the emotional fortitude mm -hmm. of not just the, the people that are trying to get out of, out of the way of the fire, the people that are trying to save their animals and their livelihoods, but it's also an emotionally trying time for all those that are trying to help. And so I think, uh, you know, in the effort of bringing us all together, if we're, we're all able to take a deep breath in these types of situations, you know, Coach John Wooden from UCLA said, be quick, but don't hurry. And, and, uh, and I think that's got a lot of resounding uh, effect for us. And, and also, uh, I've heard from a number of my friends that, you know, sometimes you have to go slower to get there quicker. And so uh, I just want to put that out there for everybody so that we're able to, to try and give ourselves the, the opportunity to take a deep breath and be calm in a time that's, that's really so strenuous, uh, tension oriented when emotions are high. So um, just wanted to add that. Thank you. I appreciate I that. Wanted Supervisor mm -hmm. Rabbit, if I could jump in for a minute. You and know, can you, uh, I'm sorry, can you also just repeat the uh, website for those that can go and register as well? The match.grace. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's matchgrace.com and it'll be out through the UC Cooperative Extension website. Okay, thank you. Yes. So I just wanted to add that the county's already developed kind of a neighborhood with the, the uh, coops and the copes and and so I just want to, we, we, what we're going to do is just build on what the county has really developed. I mean, we've already got kind of a neighborhood um, working groups. And so what to put this survey out, we want to just build on that. And then of course, more of the rural areas may not have that. So it's, it might be something that we could um, duplicate out in those areas as well. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I, there's one last thing I do want to make mention of, and that is, again, it was mentioned earlier. When I was at um, the fairgrounds, I saw trailer, trailers full of uh, equipment that was just brought over uh, because it was needed by, I think, Martin Ranch Supply, but also Wine Country Ranch Equipment. I'm sure they're not the only ones. I probably shouldn't pick just two, but uh, those are more down my way. Um, and what happens in Sonoma County when a uh, disaster strikes is that everyone steps up. And we can't say thank you enough to all the volunteers, but that's also the businesses that are out there. And that goes also on the feed side for animals that uh, I know that they come through uh, with whatever you need, uh, either with deep discounts or even better. And we can't say thank you enough for that as well. And I also wanna uh, thank the haulers that are out there, whether it's CARP, NorCal livestock evacuations. I wanna thank Julie Atwood of the Halter Project. And I wanna make mention that they do have a comprehensive resource library with a wide range of planning tools, preparedness videos, and information, both in English and Spanish. Uh, and visitors to their website can also access the UCCE Farming 101 and Backyard Farming Disaster Preparedness Workshop presentation. So that's a great resource as well. You heard other websites, um, both from UCEE, the Facebook page for uh, the fairgrounds here in Petaluma, uh, for the county's uh, site, and certainly SoCo Emergency should be front and center. Uh, there's lots of information out there, um, and if you uh, get lost through the process, feel free to reach out to both e uh, either Supervisor Zane or myself, and we can point you uh, where you need to go. I also want to say thank you to the Sonoma County Farm Bureau. They've been front and center on all these issues as well. Uh, the Sonoma County Horse Council, um, and again, those veterinarians that you mentioned, but most of all, those who I saw in Petaluma are those who do uh, seemingly uh, the greatest work all the time, and that's our 4-H and FFA members here in Sonoma County who are always uh, out there taking care of any animal that is in need. Uh, so just got to say thank you to uh, all those, as well as everyone in this panel uh, for all the work that you do. Um, looking back at 17 and the disaster that struck that year, and certainly every event is different, 
uh, we are in such a better place because of the dedication, professionalism, and the preparedness uh, that all of you have done, led by our Christopher Godley in the Department of Emergency Management. But I know each and every one of you play an important role. And uh, I got to say thank you so much. Uh, we don't want to ever have another disaster, but the reality is that uh, something will roll around and we're always going to be prepared uh, to step up and take care of business when we need to uh, and be there for folks and animals. Um, so with that, I think we're almost out of time. Supervisor Zane? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, again, I wanted to call out the volunteers because we have a ton of volunteers who step up, whether it's at the fairgrounds or with animal control or, or all the different ways they volunteer, but we really couldn't take care of our animals without them. So I want to thank them. And, and just remind everybody that's listening is that we do have a red flag alert this weekend. As Mr. Godley reminded us of, we did have a vegetation fire today. Um, so it's really imperative that everybody take very good care and, um, and be careful out there. Great, I think uh, if, if we're at 7.01, so we almost made it on time. Again, I, I appreciate very much everyone taking the time tonight, uh, both in this panel and those who are viewing this. Uh, we'll keep it active and live. Or, well, we'll keep it live, not live, but we'll uh, make sure the recording is out there. Uh, but if there are questions that come through, uh, always feel free to reach out and uh, we will uh, work to continually make things better as we go forward and learn from the past. And uh, we've done that and we are in a much better place. So again, thank you everyone for being here tonight. And I think with that, we'll all sign off. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.